Hi everybody, it's Vicki Hensey. Today I want to continue with the Inspire Me series. This is part five, Things You Can Control. We all like to have the illusion that we are in control of our lives and our destinies and our careers. The truth is, we don't really have a whole lot of control. Things are moving at the speed of breath and blink. And that means that we have to be, above all things, flexible. There are, however, a few healthy attitudes that we can have toward the events in our lives and the situations in our lives and things that we can control. The first and the most important to your career is the quality of your work. You can determine that. Only you can uh, enhance the quality or expend the effort and the energy and the time necessary for studying the craft, studying the business, to make sure that you produce the best work you're capable of producing. I, I like to say, good enough is never good enough. It has to be your best by your standards. Now understand that the longer you write, the more, um, and the more that you invest in writing well, then the the better you'll get over time. But always, always, at the time that you are writing, settle for nothing. Uh, do the very best that you can do at that given time. So the quality of your work is truly one of two things that you can control. Let's talk about some other things where you want to uh, do as much as you can to help yourself with with the control factor, let's call it. Balancing in your life, or balance in your life. If you're all work and no play, you're going to be kind of miserable. If you're all play and no work, you're definitely going to be miserable if you're a writer, because writers who are not writing are not content. And we want to be content, we want to be fulfilled. Those things serve balance well. So look for balance a healthy balance where you're not ignoring this or that or the other, but you're looking for a happy medium, so to speak, so that the physical side, the emotional side, the spiritual sides of you all feel nourished and nurtured. That's really important to your creativity and to your sense of well-being. Too many authors fall into traps of, uh, of, of going the all work route. And then when they get to the point to where they're submitting and things are out of their control, then they start with the emotional imbalance and the physical toll on the body sets in. And it's not a good thing for the writers. So we can avoid that by starting out from the very beginning, looking for a balance, a healthy balance where we understand that we're three-dimensional human beings and we take care of and nurture all three aspects of us so that the whole of us can be more well-adjusted, happier, more content, more fulfilled by what we're doing. The second thing is to uh, weigh other people's opinions. When you're writing and you, you, you know, you really want somebody else to read your stuff and see what they think, what you're really after is for them to tell you how wonderful it is, that positive feedback and positive reinforcement. What you may get may not be that. You may get a Nina, like I got, uh, my mentor. She bled red over everything that I wrote for many years, and and, you know, I'd get a package back from her and, and I would look at the pages and there'd be so much red, I'd say, good Lord, there's no way all of that red ink could fit in one pen. It had to take her half a dozen. But, but, she made me dig, she made me work, she made me do the very best that I could do. And now, these 20 odd years later, I still will ask myself, 
What would Nina think of that? Would she think that, that was up to snuff? So there are huge benefits in having people tell you what they can tell you to help you improve. Understand when you ask someone for a critique. Um, I used to say I was the critique partner from hell. And, and it had absolutely nothing to do with my desire uh, or, or my overall attitude about the work. It had to do with me. With me feeling like I needed to be as dedicated and as invested as Nina was invested and dedicated to me. Nina looked at that work and gave it 100% of everything she had to give. She did... The, the grammar, the line editing, the content, the characterization, the setting, the plot. She looked at all of it. And she looked at all of it as a whole to make sure that the elements all work together really well. Because she did, she made me a better writer. And so when I started critiquing, that was my goal. I'm going to give that person everything that I have to give them. Now... On the receiving end of that critique, I'm not going to say anybody fell in a dead faint. I am going to say we had a few close calls. However, it made them better writers too. Or it made them look at something, see an opposing view, and decide, is this the way I want to go or does this idea have merit? And that really, it's up to the, uh, to the person, the writer. The first thing that I always say when I, when I hand someone a critique is, look at it, take what you find of value, ditch the rest. The reason that I say that is because only you have the whole vision, the true vision, the in-depth vision that encompasses everything of your story. I can't have that. I can't see into your mind, neither can anyone else. So you look for, you look at what suggestions and recommendations are offered to you, but you take them with, not with a grain of salt, but with a grain of salt. Uh, and you weight them based on your view of the whole big picture. Uh, take what works for you. Let go what doesn't. It's your story in the very end. You can control what you do and what you don't do. Some things I would suggest you don't do. Deliberately antagonize other people, whether they are authors, editors, or agents. I have seen people sit at luncheons and badmouth editors, and those editors were sitting at the very next table. Now, how do you think that served anyone well? And it, did, it made everybody at the table uncomfortable also. So it didn't do any good. It did a lot of harm. You can control these things. Use your good judgment. Use your common sense. Uh, use your wisdom in just how you would like to be treated. If you make a commitment keep the commitment. If you can't keep the commitment, give as much advance notice as possible. Life happens. It happens to all of us. But understand that when, like for instance, a deadline. What happens when you miss a deadline? Well, everyone else beyond you has to adjust their schedule all the way through production. The editor who had scheduled time to read it when you said you'd have it done has to shift things. The line editor, the copy editor, all the way down the line, the art department, the marketing and sales departments, everybody's schedule gets goofed up. So when you make a mess for them, I mean, when you make a mess for you, you're making a mess for them too. Just something to keep in mind. Have the same consideration for others that you hope that they would have for you. Um, and, and the shoe will be on the other foot at times. I've had editors who were delayed at getting things back to me. Uh, for example, you send in a proposal. You're waiting for approval on the proposal to write the book. The book has a deadline. And for some reason or another, 
The editor is delayed in getting back to you, or perhaps her senior editor is delayed, and so she can't say and she can't give you the go ahead until her senior editor signs off on it, or until the editorial director signs off on it. So you have people down the line that are impacted on the other end, on the other side of that desk when it's an editor as well. And all of those things can cause delays in your schedule. So you have to remain as flexible as you can and allow yourself, when you set those deadlines, allow yourself a little playtime, a little flexibility in there. Because things, things happen to all of us. And you need to be as understanding as you hope that they will be. Things you can control, reactions to what other people do and what other people say. You know... We're human beings, and very often there's a little disconnect between our brains and our mouths, and that's, I don't care who you are, it happens. You'll put your foot in your mouth, shoot, sometimes I go all the way to the kneecap, once in a while to the thigh, not proud of it, don't want it, nobody wants it, but it happens to all of us. So we have to be really careful with our words and with our actions and with what we do and make sure that the impact on other people isn't going to be a negative impact. We don't want to have a negative impact. We don't want to uh, deliberately hurt someone's feelings or make them feel bad about what they're doing. As writers, we know, we study emotions, we study motivations, we study intentions and reactions, and we know that people can get scars from the least little thing. Uh, because what is significant to that person depends on that person. It varies. We have some universal things in common, but we also have little things that are different that, that are extremely hot buttons or tender spots to us. So while we can control, um, we cannot, we can control our own actions. We can't, we can also control our reactions to things that other people do and other people say. I had a bit of advice when I was pretty young, and it was always give a person a graceful exit. Even if you're right, you don't have to shove that in somebody else's face. Even if you can zap them to Mars for something that they have done that was just downright ugly or unethical or hurtful doesn't mean that you have to do it. If you can give that person a graceful exit, they know what they've done. You don't have to slam it in their face. So you can give them a graceful exit, then they can, not to save face, but to let them know there is a better, more constructive way to deal with these type things. So what you're really doing is teaching. And I, I thought that was really good advice. I try to live by it, and I hope that it'll help you in your um, interactions with other people. Because I'll tell you, sometimes you can say something and you have no secondary meaning to it, no alternative meaning to it, but it'll be taken wrong. And unless that person tells you that bothered me, or, or that hurt my feelings, or whatever. You know, people very often will internalize things rather than uh, communicate their reaction to you. And when they do that, it, it can make it very difficult for you to understand what's happening in the relationship, to change the dynamic. Someone suddenly isn't very friendly anymore. You may not have a clue in the world why. They know why, but they haven't shared it with you. So let's follow the wise advice and clear up challenges where we can gently, with dignity and grace and compassion, and give people a graceful exit. It costs you nothing. It gains a lot. You can control your plan or your strategy. When we... Um, well, we, we talked about that in earlier segments of Inspire Me, so I'm not really going to get into it here. However, you are in control of that plan and that strategy, and you can make it as flexible as you need for it to be. As I said earlier, 
Things in this business are changing at the speed of blink and breathe. I might have said breathe and blink. I don't remember, but you will. Anyway, things are changing really fast. And when things change really fast, a writer who wants to stay employed and wants to continue to write or is depending on income from writing has to remain flexible. Not just in your in your work, but in your attitude. Don't be a naysayer. You'll eat your words every time, and that's what causes middle age weight gain, by the way. So be flexible. Review your plan, review your strategy, and do it often. Change it as it needs changing. Understand what um, another thing that you can control is to understand the driving force within you that keeps you motivated and disciplined. I would repeat that, but I hope I don't have to to let you know how important it is. You know what makes you sit down and write. You know what keeps you writing when you'd rather be out at lunch with the girls or out playing golf or doing whatever. You know what keeps you at your desk. You understand it. Make sure that you continue to understand it and don't lose sight of it. Because there are going to be a lot of times, I don't care what career you're in or how how smooth you think that career shall, shall go or how smoothly it does go for however long. You're going to hit brick walls. You're going to hit snags. You're going to run into people that make your life challenging to appreciate. You're going to hit changes in the business that you don't like and you're you're going to quit at some point in time and then two minutes later decide, you know, I really don't want to quit. I need to handle this in a more constructive way. However, to try to stay balanced during all of that time, you need to know what it is that makes you want to write and you need to keep knowing and it will change over time. You may start out with one set of goals at the end of year one, have an entirely different set of goals. At the end of year five, or with the way things are changing now, this month you may have these goals. Next month you may have an entirely different set of goals. That's fine as long as you know what they are and you're respecting them and you're letting the people in your immediate circle know what your goals are and, and so that they're in the loop. They're not out chasing something for you that you don't want. Uh, by that, I mean the people in your group. I mean your agent, your editor, those people immediately around you who have a significant impact on your career. Make sure that they know what you want at all times and that the two of you discuss strategy and that you discuss what you want to do and why you want to do it. The better that these people understand you and the more that you involve them in your dream or your career strategy, the better position they're in to help you attain those things that you're after. The last thing that I want to talk to you about in taking control or things that you can control is yourself. You control you. And it's easy to lose sight of that, uh, especially in a creative career. It's, it's, it's like we spend so much time inside and we get so wound up in the work that the work is us. We start viewing the work as us, and it's not. It's part of us, but it's not all of us. And so we have to keep, keep our mind firmly planted on what we want to do, not just in this work, but in this life what we hope to accomplish. You control the way that you act, the way that you react. You control what you do and what you don't do, how much discipline you have, you know, how you look at things, how you react to bad reviews. It's all, all of those things are in your control. And I'm saying, look, this is the one thing I want you to get out of this whole bit of business. Don't let others define you. 
don't let others tell you you must react this way because it's expected or required or whatever. Don't do that. You decide. You have a good brain, a good mind, logic, common sense. You're expected to use it. You have good judgment. You have values and ethics and standards. You know what drives you to work. You know what, what um, keeps you content, balanced, and fulfilled. Now, in all of this, understand, you're not an island, so you don't get to do all of what you want to do. You get to do part of it, though. You have to have the same respect for others. You have to respect your readers. You have to respect your coworkers. You have to respect your peers. You respect other people in your decisions. Again, dignity and grace and graceful exits. Holding yourself to the highest standards and ethics and overlooking little infractions that others don't intend to be offensive. You can control all of those things. And if you control those things, it will help you to keep the proper perspective on all of the other things that you can't control. I hope that this has been of help to you and wish you many, many blessings.